Melvindale is in a sub-region of Metro Detroit that's known as Down River. It's about 11 miles southwest from downtown Detroit. Bordering it to the north and east is Detroit, with a small shared border with Dearborn. Allen Park is Melvindale's neighbor to the south and west, while Lincoln Park borders Melvindale to the southeast. The main thoroughfares for Melvindale are Oakwood Boulevard, Dixon Allen Roads, along with West Outer Drive. Melvindale, or Smelvindale, as some locals call it, is surrounded by factories, most notably the Marathon Oil Refinery in Detroit, Zug Island further east in River Rouge, the Detroit Water and Sewerage Plant is somewhere in the middle of all of that too. You also have the historic Ford River Rouge Plant in Dearborn. Additionally, you have the dozens upon dozens of chemical storage tanks east of town that line the Rouge River along its path towards the Detroit River. There's another couple dozen or so chemical tanks that line Melvindale's southeast border along I-75. Additionally, the city is split by the Norfolk Southern Railway, which has a huge rail yard throughout its span in Melvindale. And for all of those reasons, all of the heavy air polluting industry that's nearby, sometimes Melvindale gets referred to as Smelvindale. Melvindale, Michigan. Stinks. Bad. Not today, though. And I don't smell anything today. But uh, depending on the way the wind blows, it could smell pretty bad here. By the way, it's not just the factories that attribute to the name of Smelvindale. Yeah, sometimes it's the people who live here, too. And I know that sounds judgmental and mean. No, I have factual evidence of this. Yeah, so don't shoot the messenger. I'm just reporting the news here and telling people what it's like to live in Melvindale because that's what I do. So hear me out, because sometimes in Smelvindale, you'll have a dwelling that's occupied by more than one person, right? And sometimes it's a young, unmarried couple. Sometimes it's a young married couple. Sometimes it's a pair of young male or female roommates by splitting the bills which is totally understandable in this economy. Sometimes it's a gay couple, you know, just want to make sure that I'm covering everything here and not leaving anyone out. And sometimes it's a man and a woman that live together who are not in a relationship, or so they say, but they are just indeed roommates. Well, not that long ago, there was a particular Smelvindale household where there was a man and a female roommate living together under 30 years old. But in this house, it was more than just the bills that were being split. Yeah, because apparently one day in the bathroom, the guy spent a little bit too much time talking to so-and-so on the phone while doing something else, if you know what I mean. And that's something else, well, you know, he, uh, let's just say he had a few too many chili dogs the night before. You know, he was de-stressing a little bit too much. Maybe a better way to put it would be you know, that he left a bun in the oven for too long. You know, he basically made a Smelvindale, if you will. Well, the bigger point is that it was so bad that it really bothered the female roommate, and it bothered her so much that the two got into an argument. The guy tried to remove himself from the situation a little bit, and he locked himself in his bedroom. And while in his room, he called his mom on the phone and said something along the lines of, Hey, Mom! This girl is crazy. What should I do? While he was doing that, the girl then went down to the basement and brought back a sword and threatened to cut the door handle off of his room. She then overheard his mom tell him to call the police, but she beat him to it and then told the police that he hadn't paid his rent in five months, which was a lie. But by the time that the police had arrived, she ran off and I'm assuming the guy moved out shortly after. <laughs> You know, you hey, sometimes in Melvindale, this is what happens. You can't make this stuff up. The last time this happened was pretty recent at the time of me uploading this video, happening on June 11th of 2024, while I'm uploading this in August of 2024. Heck, that was only five days before me filming this video on June 16th. How about that? Anyway, no word on the last time that's happened in Melvindale, but I'm working with the research department on that one. And as far as I know, it seems to happen here, you know, about once every three years or so. Obviously, I'm kidding about that. But anyway, otherwise, Melvindale isn't a terrible place to live in. Just make sure that if you're in your 20s and you live in Melvindale and maybe just maybe you're looking for a roommate to help split the bills, just make sure you do a full background check, you know, 
Make sure they don't have any, oh, I don't know, um, swords that they're going to be bringing with them. I mean, seriously, what is this? The medieval era? Or is that just how business is handled downriver? You know, last time I checked, Airsoft Fatty once lived in Battle Creek, Michigan, not Melvindale. And if you don't know who that is, you can look him up. Well, anyway, if that's how people in downriver handle business and you live downriver or more specifically, you live in Melvindale, feel free to either confirm or deny that in the comments whether or not drawing swords is a common way to handle an argument. Okay, so anyway, when driving around Melvindale, you just get a strong blue collar feel. Melvindale doesn't look abandoned or anything like some other nearby cities do. There's really not much blight here at all. The population of Melvindale was never large, but it also hasn't seen a huge decline over the years, despite what the majority of downriver communities have seen, which surprises me because the reason why these downriver cities have lost so many people over the years is because there aren't near as many blue collar factory jobs as there used to be. So despite that being a factor, and despite Melvindale's close proximity to some major industries that heavily pollute the surrounding air, Melvindale's population hasn't dropped really all that much. And that's impressive. Back in 1970, Melvindale saw a peak population of 13,800 people, but it only declined by 3,000 over a 40-year stretch before actually seeing a growth rate of 20% between 2010 and 2020. That being said, Melvindale hasn't been without its problems over the years, although there's been not near as many problems as nearby eCourse, in which you can check out that video here. But back in 2016, there was some drama in the Melvindale Police Department. Then Police Chief Chad Hayes was terminated after the second of two hearings at Melvindale City Hall to discuss his future as a police chief. Hayes had worked for the Melvindale Police Department for 25 years at the time. Several officers gave testimonies to claim that Hayes created a toxic work environment, stating that Hayes referred to the mayor through vulgar name-calling. Hayes denied those claims, but further claims stated that he disciplined an officer without filing the proper paperwork and that he didn't approve of the city's towing company. He proceeded to ask officers to not give the towing company any business. After Hayes was terminated, an article came out by the Detroit Free Press a few years later highlighting how Hayes seemed to have been trying to stop a towing scam. Hayes filed a wrongful termination lawsuit in U.S. District Court over his firing. The lawsuit was filed against the city of Melvindale and the city council, saying that he was fired because he failed to meet ticket and towing quotas and because he was trying to stop this guy, Matthew Furman, from being what he called the cash cow for the city. In the lawsuit, Hayes claimed that Furman was accountable for 80% of the city's tows from 2015 to 2016, with up to eight towed cars a day, bringing the city of Melvindale $500,000 over the course of the year. In a counterclaim from Furman against Hayes, Furman claimed that Hayes was a racist, racist by directing officers to only ticket minorities and how, for that reason, Hayes's firing was justified. However, out of all of the complaints against Hayes, Furman was the only one to label him as a racist. The city, however, went on to back up their reasoning for firing Hayes by stating that Hayes posted negative comments on social media about a potential police dispatch merger. <laughs> oh no, how dare he posting negative comments on social media. Disgusting. Look. What he did wrong there was he used his main profile for the comments. What he should have done was create a burner account with some made up name and a dog as the profile picture. That way nobody would ever know that it was him as long as he remembered to sign out when using his work computer. Anyway, the city continued to justify firing Hayes by stating that he suspended Furman twice for using excessive force. But while doing so, Hayes didn't go through the proper protocols. Lastly, the city dug their heels into the ground by stating how Hayes ordered officers to stop towing vehicles unless it was absolutely necessary. The city followed that by saying that at no time have defendants engaged in policing for revenue. The city also defended Furman by saying that he was investigated by the Michigan State Police but was cleared from any wrongdoing. 
Hayes, however, stated that Furman had received dozens of complaints from citizens stating how Furman was rude, aggressive, abusive, and racist. Hayes continued to say how Furman has gone as far to remove sick and elderly citizens from their cars in order to tow their vehicle to help make some profit for the city. Keep in mind that this was all a while ago, back in 2018. Well, Hayes' lawyers say that the lawsuit uncovered some new findings, including how Furman was caught bragging to a co-worker about how he needed to keep towing cars in order to help make the city some money. Other findings included how the president of the towing company was friends with the mayor, city administrator, city attorney, and with Furman, and how Furman went to the towing company's holiday parties, went out on the owner's boat, and went to dinners at his house and at restaurants. Another finding was how the city threatened Hayes' key witness and police lieutenant, Michael Welch, with retaliation putting his job on the line because Welch was on Hayes' side of all of this. At the time of this published article, the Detroit Free Press tried to reach out to the city of Melvindale, with nobody responding for comments other than the city attorney, Lawrence Coogan, who cited that it was policy to not comment on pending litigation. The police chief who took over after Hayes' departure, John Allen, also declined to comment initially, but then went on to say how he got along with Hayes his whole career and how he was concerned about him for losing his job. Allen continued to say how he never saw any wrongdoing by Hayes, how he never heard him tell police officers to racially profile citizens, and how he couldn't figure out for the life of him why Hayes was fired. He also said how Hayes was a professional and how the department was not toxic while Hayes had the job. If you ask me, that's quite an endorsement for Hayes from the new police chief John Allen at the time, who had no obligation to say good things about Hayes, and did so despite the risks of having a target against him from his employer, the city of Melvindale, during all of this drama. So to me, there's a lot of credibility there because there was another police lieutenant, once again during this time, that was on the verge of being fired for being on Hayes' side of all of this. So yeah, that took some courage from John Allen on speaking on behalf of Hayes during this time, no doubt. Allen didn't stop there, however, as he continued to support Hayes' decision to suspend Furman the two times that he did, as Furman allegedly slammed a man's head into a patrol car while being handcuffed. That man was arrested on a drug charge and for theft of a wagon, did his time, and then filed a federal civil rights violation lawsuit against Furman. The other suspension came in 2016 when a woman complained about Furman pulling her out of the car and forcing her over the hood with her two toddlers in the back seat. However, Furman stated that he gave her every opportunity to exit the vehicle and she didn't, and then followed it up by admitting that he removed her from the car with physical force. She had a warrant for her arrest, no car insurance, and a tainted yellow plastic cover over the license plate, making it unreadable. Furman was suspended by Hayes yet a third time a few months after the previous incident for injuring a robbery suspect's head. The suspect, however, led police on a half-hour pursuit and was resisting arrest. The injury to the head occurred when the suspect was refusing to get into the vehicle. It was only a few days after that when Hayes ended up getting suspended himself and then eventually he was fired. More on that in just a few seconds as this is Melvindale High School, home of the Cardinals. Among the most notable alumni is former professional boxer, Mickey Goodwin. What up, Mick? We can talk more about how the high school does in terms of academic performance later when I do the Chris Livability score. Alright, so back to the police drama as factual evidence showed that during the times that Furman was suspended, towing revenue for the city dropped significantly, going from around fifteen dollars to $30,000 per month in revenue down to just $7,000 per month. The Free Press article went on to state how the towing company kept 85% of every towing fee that was collected by the police, while Melvindale received the rest. So, yeah, no wonder why the city liked Furman so much. No wonder. What's also suspicious is how Furman's towing numbers skyrocketed faster than Nick Cannon's child support funds, going from 460 towed cars a year to 1,137 Damn. when the new towing company became contracted by the city. So, yeah, not really a good look for Furman there. After all of this, later in 2019, Furman found himself in yet another scandal. 
Furman was alleged to have contact with a drunk and disorderly person, causing them to fall. The victim was injured from the fall and was transported to a hospital. Prosecutors claimed that Furman threw a bowl across the man's kitchen, which knocked him down a flight of stairs. Furman was charged with assault and battery, along with a willful neglect of duty. Furman was given one year of probation under the condition that he attended anger management classes, and if he could do that, the assault and battery charge would be dismissed. But the drama doesn't stop there, as Furman was fired shortly after that case, but then Furman followed that up with a lawsuit against the city of Melvindale for wrongful termination. Furman, however, stated that his firing was due to him being honest while being investigated for the towing scam. So, after years of buying into the towing scam himself, Furman then said that he was ordered to tow cars based on the race or sex of the car's owner, stating that if it was a white female, he was not to tow the car, but if it was a black female or male, then he was to tow the car. Furman continued to say how the city was skimming profits and embezzling funds, and also how they sold off towed vehicles at auctions to friends and to themselves at discounted prices. Well, amazingly, after all of this drama and after all of the shenanigans, it appears as if Furman is still with the Melvindale Police Department, as not that long prior to me uploading this video, Channel 7 did a news story in the summer of 2024 on how Melvindale Police crack down on speeders. Furman has made other media appearances as well since all of the pre-2020 drama, stating how Melvindale Police officers have the second lowest pay rate among Metro Detroit departments and how his department has a high turnover rate for their officers. Speaking of turnover rates, the population for Melvindale saw a huge boost from 2010 to 2020, but it seems to be declining again. The most recent estimates say that Melvindale is home to 12,600 people, a few hundred less than what was seen in the 2020 census count. The median household income is $38,900 per year, which is really, really bad. Not good at all. Only 13% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher. The median value of a home is $95,000, and the poverty rate is as high as 33%. When it comes to the crime rates, Melvindale sees above the national average violent crime rate, but it's below the Michigan state average, so not really all that bad. Additionally, the property crime rate is fairly low, and for a cash-strapped, economically-deprived town, those crime numbers are actually pretty good when compared to other cities that face similar economically challenged problems. Now onto the history of Melvindale and how the city came to be. At the time of me uploading this video, Melvindale is approaching its 100th birthday. Melvindale was founded as a village on September 9th, 1924, and then changed its status to a city nine years later. Before incorporating as a village, Melvindale was a part of the now-defunct Ecorse Township and consisted of ribbon farms spanning between the Ecorse and Rouge Rivers. For a short time, the then-unincorporated area had the name of Oakwood Heights before incorporating as Melvindale. Originally, Melvindale was developed as a residential community to house workers at the Ford River Rouge plant, getting its name from one of the original developers, Melvin Wilkinson. The city only had a population of about 4,000 during the 1930 census count. You can see from this 1915 map about nine years before Melvindale existed that Melvindale was nothing more than a collection of ribbon farms. Just east of Melvindale was Oakwood, which eventually became a neighborhood of Detroit and the location of the massive Marathon oil refinery. And then further east along the Detroit River, the city of River Rouge was already alive and well, along with the city of Ecorse, just south of it. Growth in Melvindale didn't start to rapidly occur until around World War II. Many of the nearby plants at the time manufactured products for the U.S. Army during the war. This aerial photo from 1949 shows Melvindale shortly after most of the city became full of single-family homes. A closer look shows that the Southfield Freeway appeared to be brand new at the time, and there's still a few open fields that had yet to be developed, along with I-75 not yet existing through this area. Population growth continued throughout the 1950s and even the 60s and 70s, around the time when white flight started to occur in Detroit City proper. 
decline didn't start to hit Melvindale until 1980, but as I alluded to towards the beginning of this video, Melvindale's peak population was 13,800 in 1970, and the population today is only down to 12,600, so that's a loss of only 1,200 or so over the course of 50 years. Once again, not bad at all when considering places like River Rouge and Ecorse to the east, despite the economic challenges that Melvindale has faced. Otherwise, there's not much to mention on the history of Melvindale. The suburb doesn't have a downtown area, rather just commercial zoning along the main thoroughfares like the one that we're on right now, Oakwood Boulevard, and then you have residential blocks in between that are made up of smaller and affordable housing. The community was literally developed at first for the sole purpose of providing housing for Dearborn's massive Ford River Rouge plant, and the look and feel of Melvindale today reflects that. You definitely get a strong, old-timer, blue-collar industrial feel when driving through Melvindale. Well, I'll be back for Chris's livability score towards the end of this video, but for now, we're going to see a little bit more of what Melvindale looks like before we get to that point. Well, people, it is now that time. You can't always trust the livability score from AreaVibes.com, but you can always trust Chris's livability score. Education. Today's Melvindale High School that we drove by earlier in the video actually sits within Allen Park city limits. It didn't always though. It seems like the city just needed some open space to build a new high school to replace the older one where the football field still stands off of Oakwood Boulevard and Prospect Street near Strong Middle School. Melvindale High School doesn't rank very highly academically with 11% of students being proficient in math, 41% in reading, and 29% in science, although there are schools that perform much, much worse than that. Education gets an 8 out of 20. Crime. Melvindale overall is a pretty safe community. It could be better though, just stay away from crazy sword fighting ninjas who get mad over bad smells. It gets a 10 out of 20. Downtown. There is no downtown Melvindale, so that's easy. It gets a 0 out of 20. Economy. The economy is not good here, obviously, with a median household income of just $38,000 per year, 
which is less than half of the national average. 33% of Melvindale's residents are living in poverty, and the median home value is less than $100,000. Many of the blue-collar factory jobs nearby have disappeared over the years, despite the Marathon facility and the River Rouge plant still operating. The future of auto manufacturing jobs in the Detroit region is always in question. Always. And unfortunately, that's what Melvindale is hanging on to, so the economy gets a 4 out of 20. Recreation. They say that in Michigan you are never 5 miles away from a lake. Well, if you're dead in the center of Melvindale, you're most certainly 5 miles away from a lake, unless you count retention ponds as lakes. You do have the Detroit and Rouge Rivers, though. But look, recreation is not Melvindale's strong suit. That's if Melvindale even has a strong suit in anything. The Rouge and Ecorse Rivers are heavily polluted, the Rouge more so than the Ecorse, and the Ecorse River isn't much more than a small creek, and it doesn't provide much opportunity at all. The Detroit River is nearby to the east, but it's the worst contaminated portion of the Detroit River as it's right where the Rouge River empties into it. Also, Zug Island is right there, so for the region's better recreational amenities, you have to travel quite a ways, so a 2 out of 20 there. History Melvindale's history isn't really all that impressive. Nearby communities at least can talk about the factories that used to employ thousands upon thousands within their city limits and how those factories manufactured ammunition and other important supplies for the U.S. Army during World War II. Melvindale is just where a lot of these people lived, but they also lived in Ecorse, Lincoln Park, River Rouge, Allen Park, Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Detroit, and dozens of other municipalities nearby, so that doesn't make Melvindale unique. If anything is cool about Melvindale's history, it's the old-time, grungy, blue-collar look and feel that's ever so present still to this day, without all of the blight and abandonment that you see in so many other similar communities like this one, so history gets a 9 out of 20. Amenities Melvindale lacks amenities. So does Melvindale's neighbors of Ecorse, River Rouge, and the southwest neighborhoods of Detroit. Melvindale does, however, have a few local favorites along the main thoroughfares that are under the radar, but pretty cool. Plus, you have a massive shopping center in Allen Park to the west that was built on top of an old garbage dump, and you have Dearborn to the northwest, which has quite a few shopping amenities as well. And neither of those shopping areas in Dearborn and Allen Park are too far of a drive for most people in Melvindale, so amenities gets an 8 out of 20. Not terrible, but could be better. Cost of Living the property taxes in Melvindale are high because every municipality in Wayne County has high property taxes, but they're not near as high in Melvindale as they are in the neighboring Ecorse, River Rouge, and Detroit. For a home that's valued at $100,000, which is the median home value in Melvindale, you would be paying $3,500 a year in property taxes. That's a little bit too high for my own liking, but it's not as bad as some other places like River Rouge or Ecorse, where you're not only paying $1,000 per year or more on a home of the same value, but you could argue that you're getting much less in return from government services in those communities as well, given how things are going over there. So cost of living gets a 19 out of 20. All in all, the Chris Livability score for Melvindale, Michigan is 60 out of 160, putting it above, putting it above the two other downriver communities that I've gone over so far, but not by much. Overall, I thought that the median household income in Melvindale was going to be a little bit higher than it was. Uh, I didn't expect a 33% poverty rate after seeing the place because I thought that most of the homes, while they didn't necessarily look like mansions, they looked pretty well kept up with and there were enough homes here and there that kind of stood out among the other homes that overall seemed to be made of a bunch of cheap crap. So yeah, the median household income surprised me, so did the high poverty rates, but then again, not really, because I know how bad the economy has been for this area and how this whole downriver area was built on manufacturing jobs. And obviously, those are not near as available as they used to be. Well, I talked about some minor corruption in Melvindale, more like some police officer drama. Didn't really involve stealing taxpayer money, just some cops being meanies by excessively towing residents' cars and making their lives miserable. But if you want to see a nearby community that has a much more severe case of corruption and a place that sees every problem that Melvindale does, but only to a much greater scale, 
check out this video here. Peace.